Well, hello everybody. Um, this is Nick Moyer. Uh, I'm the Chief Photographer with the Sydney Morning Herald. Um, unfortunately, I can't be with you tonight. Um, I've had some last minute um, New South Wales Rural Fire Service training um, opportunity come up for me. And so I really needed to jump on that. And it just happened to be right now. Um, so anyway, <clears throat> I'm going to be showing um, the same pictures. Um, it's just that you can't uh, hurl abuse to me. Um, so haha. -ha. Anyway, um, so what I will be showing is um, essentially uh, I, I am a um, storm chaser um, and also a wild, wildfire photographer. Um, I've been specializing in these um, like floods, environmental phenomena storms, bushfires for about the last 25 years um, in my role at the Sydney Morning Herald. So in the last seven years in particular though, um, it has really ramped up in particular in New South Wales. Um, historically I've covered um, a lot of fires, um, floods, storms in New South Wales and the US. Um, but what I'll be showing tonight is uh, yeah, New South Wales um, generally, and also uh, yeah, just the the real amp up in um, in just these extremes. Okay, so the first image that I'm going to show tonight. So this is um, when the drought really started to bite in 2017. So the year before we'd had um, very wet in um, particularly west of the ranges um, in central west New South Wales. This is far southwest, so this is around uh, Barranald, so down near the Victorian border, but in the far southwest of New South Wales. Um, you've got sheep, you know, this is a drone picture, um, sheep running across, um, you know, the, uh, the, you know, the, the drought affected landscape. Um, but also just to, to the drone, use of drone here, it's, it's, it was sort of an early, um, the first generation of a decent um, camera on a drone. For those that are interested, it was a, um, uh, a DJI Phantom 4 Pro. Um, it was the kind of the first one that really had a, a, a good camera on it. So um, getting up a little bit of height really gives you a, a bit of scale of just um, how, you know, how uh, widespread uh, and vast the terrain is that was affected by drought. Uh, this is just, uh, you know, so a, a lot of the stuff I do is just driving around and, and just seeing what I discover. Um, so th there's actually water droplets on, on these lens. Uh, this was a little bit of um, some just very strong winds essentially ripping through um, central west uh, New South Wales. Okay, so this was the first of the really big fires, but this was in um, 2017. So this is the Sir Ivan's fire. Uh, that was around Cassilis. Um, uh, so that's it's sort of north of Moree or east of uh, Dubbo. Um, it's, uh, it was a very severe fire and it um, was the sort of the first in recent times to produce a big pyrocumulonimbus. So essentially that's a rotating thunderstorm that um, developed um, not from the instability in the atmosphere from like an upper trough or something like that, um, but through the heat of the actual fire. And then the wind shear was able to make that storm rotate. Um, so uh, getting out to that fire, uh, the, like, apart from the main fire being a real problem, the actual, um, you can see the, the clouds up in the sky there, that's, uh, that's actually smoke clouds. So that's the uh, what's called the anvil. So it's a a huge, uh, uh, you would see this n normally in a thunderstorm. Anyway, it was dropping lightning bolts ahead of the main fire, and so it was creating new fires ahead of it. Okay, so we're jumping ahead uh, an entire year. Um, 2018 was fairly, um, well, there was plenty of drought sort of stuff, but I've jumped ahead now to the first of um, the images uh, probably the, the first important image I took in 2019 of the Black Summer fires. So this is around um, near Taree. It's a place called um, Hillville. So the Hillville fire um, 
or essentially would move east, west, north, south, really just depended on whichever whichever way the wind was going, it would push, uh, it would just push in that direction. Um, so this uh, evening, um, it was the, it was a catastrophic day. And um, late in the evening, just ahead of a cold change, um, it uh, ripped through the little um, town of Failford, um, which is, yeah, just to the south, um, southeast of Taree, just east of the freeway. Uh, now, I came across, uh, essentially, at this time of night, the actual, it had calmed down a bit, but um, firefighters were just so overtasked. There were so many fires um, occurring at that time um, that sometimes fire was just creeping through backyards. Uh, and this, I came across this scene where a little dinghy was being used um, as a garden bed and um, yeah, the fire had got up onto it and it was setting on fire. It was like a really bizarre scene. Um, for the, the house was saved. Um, and later on, I actually um, got in contact with the, the woman whose place that was and sent her a print. Um, so, I mean, that was a sort of a good story that came out of that. That was, this is the same night. So this is um, some of the difficulties. Um, the brigade that was sent there was um, an ACT um, fire and rescue brigade. Um, they essentially were just trying to just, it's just following your nose. Um, I mean, it, it wasn't really until the evening that you could really see exactly where the fires were um, because the smoke was so intense. So this guy was defending several properties um, with his little hose. However, the fire was moving pretty, like it was moving pretty slowly it, at this stage. But a little bit long, later on, it really ripped up um, as the southerly moved through. So this is one of the houses um, that, um, yeah, the fire just crept up to and, 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 and burnt down that evening. So the next day, uh, I mean, this is kind of a, um, this was a frustrating day for me because I couldn't get um, uh, this image published, but for me it was quite important. Um, so these guys are trying to do draft water um, from uh, the leftovers in, from rainwater tanks. They were just, there was no water in dams. Um, there's it, it, down around this area. There were no um, uh, a, um, like nowhere you could uh, no hydrants, and so it, it just was nowhere to get water from, uh, from. So a lot of the times they were losing properties because they just didn't have any water. Um, there's not much you can do. So you can see on the left there that shed is on fire. Um, it's just smouldering and burning away. They're just trying to pull the last scrapes of. Of um, water out of the bottom of those tanks. So this was a pretty full-on day. So it wasn't actually even a catastrophic day. However, um, what was going on was the fires around Hillsville. There's a number of uh, mountains um, around there, all sort of large hills, and the fire would want to go up those hills, even with uh, like not very strong winds anywhere around. It would want to go up the hill. So it would, it would actually create its own sort of plume above that, um, that mountain. And then um, it would uh, drop uh, like embers and stuff and spot fires all over the place, all around there, almost like a volcano erupting. And um, you know, this grass fire erupted and some um, fairly decent easterly winds, uh, sea breeze started to push through. And uh, this fire was in front of a, a farmhouse, and this uh, unit from the um, Kundal Moto um, uh, Rural Fire Service um, ripped up, and they were trying to get their hoses out in time, but this um, this uh, fire just ripped in ahead of them. That's the senior um, uh, deputy captain there trying to uh, unravel the, the hoses as they um, battle this um, fast-moving grass fire. Uh, it... it you know, it was kind of a, a minor burnover. We, we all had to take cover behind the back of the truck and we were just completely shrouded in smoke and embers and heat. It was pretty uncomfortable. It was, yeah, very uncomfortable. Uh, so this is the same fire. So this is, um, if like I was talking about before, where it was up in the mountains and the, the smoke was rising up uh, and just dropping spot fires everywhere. So what you will also see here is, um, you, like, uh, you can see the fence coming from the bottom right and going up to the centre uh, left. And then I've 
mirrored that um, with that hose, which comes from the, the bottom left and heads to the center right. Uh, and so you've got a sort of a cross formation there. So just playing a little, around a little bit with, um, with my composition there. Okay, so this is the famous Gosper's Mountain fire. So this, it had started um, a, about a week or so earlier um, and it, um, it just twiddled around. Um, they couldn't really, they tried sending it ra out remote ex uh, area firefighting teams by helicopter out, but it, they just couldn't um, really get a handle on it. It was very dry out there. It was a lightning strike fire to begin with. So these guys are with the Putty um, Rural Fire Service. So this is out the Putty Road. So they're, you know, 20, 30 kilometres to the east of it. However, even at that stage, it just, once the North Westleys got hold of it, um, you knew exactly where it was going to go. It, it was going to head towards um, Collar Heights. Um, it, had, it took, you know, it took about a week to get there, but it was going to get there. It, there was nothing in its road apart from the Putty Road, and that was not going to stop it. So one of the real problems with um, with uh, the Gospers Mountain, um, the Greenwattle Creek, um, and the Currawan fire, uh, quite a, a lot of the fires actually down in the, in, in southern New South Wales um, was they were producing pyrocumulonimbus um, fire thunderstorms and they were dropping lightning. Now this is a really difficult picture to get. Um, so lightning in the day from a from a you know a fire thunderstorm. Um, yeah, really, really tricky. So um, essentially, you're just having to wait. Uh, and, you know, lightning bolts, sometimes they're just flashes, but sometimes they're, you know, they're multiple strikes. And so this time I got lucky with that. Um, so this is actually taken at Colo Heights um, as uh, the fire was sort of uh, making its way north and south of Colo Heights. Um, Oh, I'm just trying to lose my way there. Yeah, so it, it, essentially they were trying to at that time, so the New South Wales Rural Fire Service and National Parks were trying to build um, control lines uh, and some backburning um, from St Albans all the way through to um, Collo Heights. And they successfully built that. However, um, one of these pyrocumulonimbus um, drop lightning bolts over the top of it and that was the end of that. So a new fire called the Three Mile Fire, and there was a number of also smaller complexes just above that in the Yengo National Park to the east of the Wallamai. Um, they started up, and then they all joined up. So this um, picture was taken in Colo Heights. Um, so this is uh, late November, I think. Uh, so, I mean, there's a couple of things going on here. It's just like the, the strong stand of a, um, of a firefighter looking out. Um, but what is going on here is the sunlight from the, the west is hitting this um, uh, corrugated iron uh, wall and then reflecting this really bright light back onto his, um, onto his pants, uh, onto, his, um, onto his jacket. And so I'm exposing for the bright areas and that way everything else um, that's in shadow or darker is becoming like very contrasty. And so it gives him real impact and stance. Um, now this picture is, um, it doesn't look like that fire is, you know, really crowning or terrible or really difficult to work with. However, it said actually had a bit of a slope. And what uh, you can see there is these guys are, are hiding behind the tree and shielding themselves because the heat column was being pushed by by the wind down along the ground so they're getting the really strong hot winds just pumping right in their face really really hard i mean it's extremely difficult to actually do anything about uh, like face um like the fire head on like that um, it's blisteringly hot okay so at this stage bob rogers was the assistant commissioner um shane fitzsimmons was the the commissioner of the new south wales rural fire service and you can see Gladys Berejiklian um, there um, looking on as they go through where all the fires were. So this is in early December. So things were very serious, but we didn't realise just how bad they were going to get. Okay, so we've got a deputy captain here um, looking out 
um, to the west of Silverdale. Um, the rest of his, uh, his brigade are actually uh, to his west, out in um, the B uh, Blue Mountains National Park, um, near a little, an isolated sort of um, village called Urandari, which is to the western side of um, uh, Warragamba Dam. Uh, or Lake Burragarang. Uh, now they, uh, the, the fire that they were trying to def um, uh, defend Urandari from was called the Green Wattle Creek Fire. It was once again lightning strike um, fires that were uh, ignited deep uh, in the bush and extremely difficult to, to um, contain. Um, so that day a number of um, firefighters were injured um, as they tried to defend um, Urandari. Um, but that fire, um, it, it was actually quite slow to move eastwards. It just kept moving eastwards and eastwards, and, and it came up against the, the, the um, Lake Burragarang. And for a time there, it actually looked like it was going to hold the fire. It was several days before it actually managed to jump over the, um, the lake. And... Um, Anyway, it, uh, it eventually did, um, and it started its approach on Oakdale and um, Orangeville uh, and a number of the other suburbs in that area. So this is that fire, the Greenwattle Creek fire, after it jumped um, you know, the, the, the water source of Warragamba Dam. Um, these guys uh, tried to defend this road, but it just, um, this is I think the 6th of December, uh, 2019 it just blasted straight through it just yeah it was a, stri a strike team of um i think it was about seven vehicles um seven trucks uh, but it just they weren't able to hold it it just um it too dry and it just tore right through so this was sort of like a bit of a street party they were all sort of um, happy having the fire um, various fire brigades around them in the back of Orangeville, um, uh, but then once it really j jumped the the dam, um, they started to get um, yeah worried, and so this is them packing up their little street party um, and starting to get the hell out of Dodge. A uh, couple of horses. Um, now the fire and rescue looked after these guys; they were fine or perfectly safe. Um, uh, later on, so it was these guys here. Um, so this is as the fire is really ripping into the back of um, of Orangeville at this stage. So just uh, edged north, it's just a little bit north of Oakdale. So this is the very far southwest of Sydney. Um, so if you think of Camden, uh, this is um, west of there. Now as the smoke um, really, you know, uh, thickened and, and the fire became closer, it became quite dark. So this is, you know, about five or six in the afternoon, but usually there's still, you know, a couple of hours of, of light to go yet. Um, these guys um, sort of underexposed the, the, the shot. So you can get the impression, you, with the lights on there, you can realise that, yeah, it's actually pretty dark. And to one of the local residents, as the fires are moving behind his house, um, and he's uh, we're just watching some of the helicopters at work, and also there were a number of um, uh, large air tankers um, uh, water bombing the fire as well at this stage. I mean, you've now got you know this was a major fire, um, and it's now in the Sydney Basin, so it's it's a real big problem. It's it's. When you've got a major fire like that that's broken into the Sydney Basin, it's yeah, it's all hands on deck. So this evening, um, just a little bit further south of this, uh, on the 6th of December, things started to quieten down and I was hanging out um, with a couple of other photographers, Dean Sewell and Matt Abbott, and um, with some fire and rescue guys from Ingleburn. Uh, and we were just at the back of this property, and just, there was, there was not really much going on. There just a very slight southerly push through, but it did something to allow a change in, I guess, the fuel-air mixture <laughs> or something, because 
it absolutely erupted. It exploded out of, it went from being about a metre height to, you know, 50 to 100 metre high flames. Um, yeah, we, um, we ran. So this is the fire and rescue guys um, uh, I'm fleeing the scene. They were just, the, the heat was just far too intense and the, the air filled with embers. Uh, so this is like true ember attack, absolutely just out of control. So this is um, one of the strongest images I took of, of the fire season. Um, so this truck just in front of the, the you know, huge uh, inferno as it erupted out, the Green Wattle Creek fire in its true fury. On the left there, you can see a um, fire vortice. So essentially you're just creating a huge low pressure center when you've got fire, like hot air is just exploding upwards. It's drawing air in and the most efficient way of putting air up is to rotate it like that. So that's, it wants to form vortices like that. You can see the truck as it's moving out of the way and onto the left, the actual fire vortice is strengthened um, and you can see it to the, the rear of the truck there. So that um, didn't destroy the house there. It did destroy a number of sheds and kind of like a, a um, granny flat out the back of the house. But they managed to defend um, the rest of the property. It had been, um, it was a, a well-maintained property um, with really good access for the fire crews. Um, so they, you know, it, it, it was a, a defendable property. Okay, so... Um, the next day, this is Warombi, so this is just north of Orangeville. So um, the fire, Green and Wattle Creek fire, once again was pushing through into the properties the next morning as the wind started to return again. Um, and um, fire bombing um, was, was, uh, uh, was occurring. So this day I, I was down near uh, a few properties um, as fire was creeping in um, behind them. Um, and I noticed what's called the bird dog. So essentially that's a, uh, a smaller aircraft that's the spotter for the big ones. So it will fly overhead and it will leave a stream of smoke behind it. And that's the target for the aircraft that are coming in behind. So I saw that uh, drop the this, this smoke line right above us. And so I yelled out to everybody, you know, get down because uh, getting hit by the actual um, if the aircraft is very low, it can really flatten you to the ground. You're, you're talking um, t uh, thousands of tonnes of, of water or hundreds of tonnes of water. Mm, maybe thousands, I can't remember. Lots of water. It's coming down and it, like a giant pink sneeze, which covers everything. Okay, so we're moving on now to... There was a, a really, um, I've edited out a, a few of the, 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 the images uh, of what occurred. Uh, essentially, a, um, another backburn attempt was made. Um, an earlier one that went from Collar Heights to Bilpin was very successful. Um, but they tried to do another one a, a from Mount Wilson uh, along the Bells on a Road, and it just went wrong almost immediately. Um, it, uh, it, it, that day I actually happened to be um, back in Sydney. I didn't expect actually anything, too much action, but yeah, I was wrong. It, it actually, it really exploded. Um, it was able to get hold of a little bit of um, westerly winds and it just tore straight into the back of Mount Tomar and destroyed several properties. So the problem they had then was they uh, or what, what's considered like one of the most dangerous places to have fire in New South Wales is what's called the Gross Valley. So it's an area between the Great Western Highway and the, and the um, Bells Line of Road in the Blue Mountains. It's a very steep, um, extremely rugged and very large um, valley. And once fire is down there, it, it, it's like you, you can't fight it. Um, it's just too inaccessible. But almost under any weather conditions, uh, other than rain, any, any, any sort of wind will blow it towards um, some sort of um, uh, 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 a, a um, township. So on the south side, you've got all the Blue Mountains um, townships from Springwood all the way through Woodford, you know, all, all the way up to Katoomba and Mount Victoria. 
On the north side, you've got Bilpin, Barambing, Mount Tomar, Bell, um, Clarence, Dargan. You've got, uh, you know, all these other small townships. So it was bad. So anyway, they then had fire on the north and south side of the Bell's line of road. Um, so this is actually the, the fire as it was mo uh, moving eastwards um, to the north of Bilpin one day. That's a, um, a water tanker going to fill up some of the fire trucks. Uh, so here we have uh, fire as it's as it's approaching, coming out of the the southern side of uh, at up towards the Bells Line Road. Now, what I'm trying to show here is actually some of the complex um, fire behaviour that's going on. You can see um, the fire ripping up in the background up the hill. That's kind of standard. However, on the uh, the foreground here, you can see fire is actually moving along and slightly down the hill. So there's some sort of um, a downdraft pushing that uh, or, or pulling that uh, that fire across the hill there. So like some really, really, really difficult um, and it's how people get caught out very easily. Um, very difficult to fight. Uh, look, this is a couple, of, they're a bit out of order actually. Um, so these are a couple of the properties that were um, destroyed um, that evening. Um, when the um, backburn got out of control. Um, now, the, the owners uh, actually up on this uh, street, they were pretty pragmatic. They kind of always, it, it was an extremely, um, extremely open to bushfires. Um, it, it's, in some ways, it was always going to happen. And uh, a number of them were like, yeah, well, we expected this to happen if we just wanted to know one way or the other. So a couple of them got in contact with me and I was able to confirm all uh, say no, your place survived, or no, it was damaged. Uh, just some of the damage and, and dangers that are on these roads um, after post fires. So it's Bell's line of road, road, Bell's line of road again as the fire jumped back across. So this is, I think, the na oh, maybe seventeenth or eighteenth of December two thousand nineteen. Okay, we're about to move forward. So this is the 21st of um, December, 2019. Uh, now, I grew up um, in the area near Bilpin, so it was kind of, yeah, dear to my heart, the area. It's a very beautiful sort of orchard area, just in the lower Blue Mountains. Um, I went to Scouts in the region. It was, yeah, I really loved the area. So this guy, he's the... Um, owner of um, a famous orchard up there um, called the the Fruit Bowl. Um, and um, this is the, the fire that's absolutely, you know, really pumping to the south of um, his orchards, which, of course, you can see are very dry. Uh, this is just RFS. I mean, they're just at this stage in sort of property protection mode. So they're just waiting to see and, and just watching to see what the, the fire actually does. This stage, it was still moving south, but it was extremely um, violent at this stage um, hadn't it was just about to um, tear into another orchard and and some homes okay so I had been with a number of other media who were at the the um, the fruit bowl however I felt that the main head of the fire was actually not going to hit there but a little bit further east um, near a place called Tutti Fruity, which is a, another little orchard. Um, and it was being defended by a strike team of fire and rescue and um, some local RFS units uh, providing assistance. Um, so these guys were just getting into position, getting out their hoses, um, and you can see in the background there the, the fire just starting to um, come across the road and just starting to push into the area. So this is... Um, the um, strike team commander um, uh, put out an order um, to the units to pull back from the homes. Um, felt that they were uh, just too um, strung out and too far away from their trucks um, to be able to def uh, defend the, the homes safely. And um, yeah, I mean, the fire was extremely powerful. It was very, very, um, very hot and very fast at this stage. So it, they pull back to the road 
and um, and just it was very much just looking at defending the the, the actual strike team itself. Um, you can see just some of the wild uh, sort of action going on there. Embers everywhere. That's a firefighter. He's got a, a actual a small fire whirl of embers um, whipping around him there as fires moving along both sides of the road. A very erratic winds. Now, one of the really dangerous things is when you are defending along a road is vehicles on that road. So um, while this was uh, going on, a, a, a local who was going, he was trying to be very careful and going along the road, he was bringing water um, for the trucks because these trucks go out of, they run out of water really quickly. Um, uh, he, he got hit by um, a, a guy in his ute um, look, he ended up being okay. Um, so I've taken a couple of shots and then um, I've assisted him back to the truck uh, because, yeah, everybody else was very busy. So unfortunately, Tutti Frutti um, was lost um, and, yeah, it was a pretty uh, demoralising um, day for the firefighters. Um, yeah, and myself, yeah. I mean, I, yeah. I was yeah absolutely uh, exhausted uh, mentally and physically because it had been like two or three months, pretty solid fires that I've been photographing. Um, I mean even even on the quiet days, it's they're just long days and you're not really sure what that day is going to bring bring because the fire conditions were just so erratic and unexpected and even even calm days, the fires themselves would be able to produce their own. Um, really erratic and, and, and violent um, fire behaviour. That's too fruity again. So anyway, I took um, holidays uh, and I went down to the south coast. Um, my dad uh, lives down near Nara and so I um, visited him with um, my, my kids. Um, this is in his place. This is um, So this is the Karawan fire as it started to approach. Um, I didn't expect it to be anywhere near as violent and catastrophic as it did and I also didn't expect it to get as close as it did to where we were. So just to our um, west um, in, in Nara, like there was a, a number of homes lost and some really intense footage of a uh, burnover by a, a, a fire and rescue strike team. So where we were in uh, Kararong, um, uh, smoke from the Karawan fire on, on this is um, uh, yeah, New Year's Eve, um, when it just absolutely went berserk, and everybody was um, we everybody was receiving emergency messages, and were sent essentially just sent um, told to go to the beach. So everybody kind of in some ways made a day of it and just went down to the beach to try and keep the kids calm. But um, at this stage, Kararong uh, was cut off by the Karawan fire. Um, it was really pretty mean. So the, I think that's a, I can't remember, 767, or it's one of the um, big water bombers um, attacking the Karawan fire. So this is, um, yeah, around a town called, um, oh, this is the Morton fire, which is essentially the Karawan fire, but when it, was, it jumped and went um, northwest um, under the influence of a southerly in, in early January. Um, this is the day when that C-130 crashed down to the um, east of, um, of uh, Kuma. And anyway, this, yeah, this fire tore out of the bush. Um, uh, it, so this, this is a little town called Penrose in the southern highlands. Okay, so it was in mid-January when we just started to get um, uh, some of the first signs of not so much drought ending, but like some, some wet weather was coming through. So we started getting some storms. So this is actually a, um, a tornado, a weak tornado um, that's really shown up by the dust. Um, and it's very, very close to a town that would become famous uh, about two and a half years later called Ugara, so uh, near Forbes. 
Ironically, it would be become known for its extreme flash floods. Okay, so this is when the the um, we're talking l late January now in 2020, and um, yeah, well, actually, the the sweeping of COVID was about to uh, go over all of us. But this is um, the first real. Um, decent storms moving through so they were picking up a lot of dust as they move through um, so this is out near orange um, as uh, the storm it's essentially just a, a big outflow gusty gusty outflow and so it's lifting up all the dust ahead of it looks mean but it's more um, more bark than bite okay so we are moving ahead now so we're talking, and this is, um, we went very rapidly from extreme drought into um, really full on flooding. Um, so I think a lot of these are a little bit out of order. Um, however, um, oh, uh, we'll just go through it. So this is actually quite close to where I live. I live in Newport um, in the uh, northern beaches of Sydney. Um, and these are some local high school kids as they um, yeah, plow through. Uh, the water, what I thought was kind of funny is you got the SES in the background and all their rescue gear and these kids are just like, eh, whatever. Just going home completely soaking wet. Uh, so uh, one of the other things I do is storm chase. And so um, this is a, like a, the storm chase here was, was difficult, but there was a lot of storms. So this was some very large hail I picked up out around Burke. Um, it was very, very difficult storm chasing um, out in those remote areas because there's very few roads that are sealed and you, can't, you just can't chase on dirt roads when they get wet. You're going to get bogged for days. So anyway, the biggest one there on the right ended up being about 11.2 centimetres. So you do not want to get bonked on the head by that. So this is actually just inside the Queensland border. So this is um, Kunnamulla. So the Warrego River, for the first time in years, was um, this wasn't in flood. It just was full. So nice and brown. Um, and these uh, local um, boys were just uh, you know having a good time jumping into the the water. So this is actually shot with a drone. Um, I chatted to the guys. They were cool being photographed, um, but uh, I couldn't get into a position to take a good picture. So I used the drone instead. Once again, another uh, use of the drone. Um, this is around Forbes. So the Lachlan River in particular really copped a beating um, in the central west of New South Wales um, throughout 2021 and 22. Um, a lot of flooding going on. Uh, just some, uh, I think they're corellas and cockatoos um, in a flock out near Kanamala as storms are building. So we've got a, a gust front here. So um, this is actually in Victoria. Um, kind of gives the impression of, um, you know, drought, but actually it was just a ploughed field. Um, but yeah, you'll just have to forgive me for that, um, being a bit cheeky. Okay, so this is a supercell. So supercells can produce tornadoes. This one didn't, but what it did get um, was a, the only time I've seen a, tornado warning um, issued by um, uh, the Bureau of Meteorology for a storm that hasn't actually produced a tornado yet. Um, so this was in the western suburbs of Sydney, near well, northwestern suburbs, so just south of Richmond, if you guys know where that is. Um, it's, so a, a, a supercell is a rotating thunderstorm. It's become organised, essentially it's inflow, it's like an engine, so it's inflow is not interrupting uh, sorry, its outflow is not interrupting its inflow. And it's a very complex sort of um, uh, organized uh, uh, like structure. Um, but when they do get like this, they can last for several hours. And when they have become really wound up, they can produce um, tornadoes. This one was really getting close to it. So the, the, that, that sort of slanted cloud that's close to the ground there, in the center of the frame is called a wall cloud. And that really is the last sort of, that's where you're going, okay, we're getting really close to a tornado now. 
So later that night, um, uh, the storms all moved out off the ocean. And this um, feature that you're seeing in the sky there is called Mamatus. So I've done a time exposure, a slow time exposure, which is um, that red light on that boat there is just the brake lights actually of a car going past. So um, a lot of the times I'll let time exposures, you never know what you're going to get. Somebody breaks in the right place and, you know, you get some beautiful light like that. Sometimes uh, life doesn't provide you a person in the right spot, so you go and stand in front of, um, in the re reflection yourself. Um, so yeah, that extremely uh, sexy man in the center of the frame there is me. Um, I'm taken, I'm afraid. But um, anyway, that's the storms as they move out over the ocean. So I think it was about a 30 second time exposure. Um, whether you guys, you know, up in Tweed, you guys get plenty of storms. Um, so very easy to photograph lightning, particularly off the coast um, at night. You know, if you whack it on, say, ISO 400 and F11 or something like that, and say 30 second time exposure, if, you know, you, you should be right. If they're very, very close and you're overexposing, then put your F-stop up to like F16. But anyway, you have a bit of a play around. Uh, lightning is, is good fun and it's actually not very hard. So this is just a sort of um, daily life storm chasing. This is, uh, it had been a supercell, but it had disorganized um, and was moving, um, moving away. This is a, a, called Mount Hope. It's a couple of hundred kilometers south of Cobar in the far west of New South Wales. And, and Mick here, he was uh, a pretty funny guy. He, uh, he goes, oh, how much are you gonna sell, send, uh, sell that photo for? Um, I'd asked him if I could take a photograph of him and he goes, oh, how much are you going to make for that? Oh, I was like, oh, thousands, mate. And he goes, well, if you give it to the Lake Cargelico police, you'll get 20 grand. So, uh, yeah, that was pretty, that was pretty good fun, uh, hanging out with, with old, with old Chris with no teeth. Um, ah, uh, this is another picture. I don't know, it's a bit out of order. So that, that's actually, um, back up in, um, Kanamala in Southern Queensland. So we've got a bit of a vortex here. So as some of these storms were becoming, you know, getting organized and wanting to rotate. And this is just looking up into um, some of the rotation. Um, it's very rare that you actually get a tornado in, uh, a decent tornado out of a storm in Australia. They tend to just um, not be able to get organized for long enough, or they just don't get what's called, you need strong wind shear and, and it's just, uh, and and the right type of wind shear, and we just tend not to get it. So pretty lightning. This is actually just from my house um, with some with a rainbow. Um, so it really was a case of just bang, 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 bang. You know, and waiting till I got a bolt in the right spot. But uh, digital film is cheap. So the Hawkesbury um, River flooded multiple times in 2020, 2021 and 2022. Um, so this is along the banks of the river. Um, this is shot with a drone. Um, just looking out over one of the uh, constantly, the, these caravan floods, uh, caravan parks where, um, well, sometimes people, you know, using them for holidays, but there are people who live in them full time. And so it was pretty devastating for them. Um, Okay, so we're coming forward through into um, October in 2022. Um, and this is the Griffith, uh, along the Lachlan River sort of region. And, uh, and so there's southwest slopes and plains and riverina of um, New South Wales. And this area was getting a lot of, of um, storms and rain. And the rivers were already... Um, they already had flood peaks going down them, and some of them were major flood peaks. So this is a, um, a line of storms moving through. Um, but move, moving through the area near Griffith. So it's quite difficult to, to get in position for some of these because the storms were very disorganized and messy. Um, and also, you know, because a lot of the time you're using the radar, um, if you don't have reception, it's very difficult to work out where you want to go. So what we've got here is called um, Inside the Whale's Mouth. So that's very turbulent um, uh, uh, 
cloud or very turbulent air behind the gust front. And I'll show you the gust front in the next frame. So that's the gust front there. That's um, Storm Chaser Brad Hannon, a friend of mine. Um, as that, um, yeah, as that uh, big gust front uh, shelf cloud formation moves through. It's quite thin, um, looks mean. Um, it, it did have plenty of rain in it. Um, as you can see, the water there all over the ground. Okay, so this line of storms really create a big problem. So the, um, the catchments further up of the Lachlan River. So this little um, Wyangala Dam was already, it was already spilling over and then it had huge um, amounts of water coming into it. So it had to do um, it, huge releases, like record the biggest releases they've ever had. And of course that um, matched with, you, you had um, flash and already riverine flooding all the way down the Lachlan meant that you had you know, major events. So, um, of course, you guys up in Tweed are no um, uh, strangers to flooding. But, um, yeah, so this area, particularly around Forbes, um, there were uh, communities that were isolated for months. Um, so this and this road, it must have cost, well, I don't know if they repaired it yet. They repaired it several times during 2022, and, and it just kept getting flooded over. Um, these are a couple of trucks just trying to get through. Um, the times there, you know, high clearance vehicles were allowed to go through, but the damage done to the roads was appalling. So here's a couple of residents of Forbes. Um, they really didn't want to go, but they'd already, because they'd already been forced out of the home multiple times, um, even in the past. I think they had, they had like four major flood peaks go through in, a, in a, a few weeks. So it was uh, very demoralizing for the entire town. So this is a, uh, a group, uh, and this is a, the Sharky family as they just wait for, you know, the water, the water's inevitable rise. So there was a real battle to try and defend their place. Um, there's Les here just bucketing and bucketing. They had pumps and every, it hit the Sharky, whose place it is, he's the local postman. and. Everybody came around to try and help him defend his place, but um, in the end, unfortunately, it just um, it crept into the, the, the back of the house, and unfortunately. So that's um, Les. He's just exhausted um, and just sitting down. So this is dawn the next morning as an RFS truck goes through some of the floodwaters um, in um, the CBD of Forbes. A number of people were caught unexpectedly, uh, caught out by the the some of the flood peaks because some of them actually were came through on parts that were not expected, and so these guys the only way out was to get onto the um, railway tracks um, and um, and walk back into town with that. So these girls um, brought their three cats with them. Now one of the Big things, um, it wasn't all bad news because of La Nina. It created a huge um, vibrance in life um, and repaired, um, brought some, some really amazing breeding seasons um, in the west of the state, um, particularly around the Macquarie Marshes. So this is at night in the Macquarie Marshes, just some of the insect life. And we've got here a major colony of um, ibis as they... Um, yeah, as they breed uh, bred in, in these multiple flood pulses that went through. So um, I was able to sneak in um, over a few days when there was in between these huge flood pulses when the entire region was cut off. But I managed to sneak in, get some really good pictures with some scientists and they did um, some research while they were there and then popped out again. It was yeah, a great, really great um, thing to be part of. Okay, um, thank you everybody. Um, I really appreciate uh, you guys uh, listening to me. I'm really sorry I could be there um, tonight. Um, but uh, yeah, I've got plenty of other pictures. Um, <laughs> not exactly, I guess, uh, uh, the most uplifting stuff. And um, certainly you guys up in the Northern Rivers have had your fair share of, um, of, of disasters. Um, but 
yeah. Um, I, as you can see, um, I've been following it for a long time, um, and the reason for that is I, I really do care about the people who have to go through this, um, and I do my best to show the uh, what they have to go through so that they aren't forgotten, um, and also that towns, uh, their history um, is not forgotten, and particularly outside of Sydney. Okay, once again, thanks very much.